<laughs> oh, just um, capturing the screen. If you record the video webcam as well, which I find useful. Okay, well, I want to now talk about is the equilibrium of the system and and that it's, it's not, I use equilibrium to analyze systems on occasions, but most of my models are running with non-equilibrium dynamics. And it's, this is a dynamic, when I say equilibrium, it's not static because it's a, ratio, it's a, a labor rate, employment rate, it's a wage to share of output, it's a debt ratio. So it's all those uh, harmonizing down, not saying they've got zero rate of change in employment, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to work at this out, of course you've got to equate each of the differentials to zero. And when I do that, it's, it's, again, it's showing the messy process that's involved in doing it. I get this expression coming out of the employment uh, rate, which lets me actually define the equilibrium profit rate. This expression out of the wage rate, which lets me define the employment ratio. And this expression here, which gives the debt ratio. So starts off looking really messy. This is doing it in general non-linear terms. So I've, rather than having a, an actual investment function, I'm just getting, I'm just saying the inverse of whatever the investment function is determines the equilibrium profit rate. The inverse of the wage function determines the equilibrium employment rate and the debt ratio this monster here but one of the nice things and this is expanding all out again using Im implicit functions rather than explicit functions one of the nice things of doing all this it actually reduces to that the debt thing just cancels down dramatically and you get this the relationship here let's try to make sense of it this here is a positive rate of profit which it says the, the equilibrium profit share here, not the profit rate, but the profit share, which is the profit profit rate is the profit share divided by the capital output ratio in the simple model. But the, what you get is a positive profit share, but it results in investment exceeding profit. Okay, that's not one where investment exactly equals profit. Profit, you see profit investment exceeds profit. What it therefore means is you get rising, you get a debt level which is maintained as the economy grows in size. Okay, so it's a positive rate of profit and it's giving investment greater than profits all the way through. This one here, that's an employment rate where the wage demands are equivalent to the rate of growth of labor productivity. So the wage demands basically say we've got equilibrium in this system if workers wage demands precisely equal to productivity growth. And of course, in the last 30 years, workers have got zilch out of productivity growth. Okay? The, the, the wages are basically um, frozen. And the debt ratio here, you get the, the, the this, is, this is depreciation plus the two growth factors exceed the equilibrium profit share. And growth is essential in the model because notice the denominator is alpha plus beta. Those are the terms, that's, that's, that's uh, uh, technical labor productivity growth and, la and population growth. If they're both zero, then the equilibrium debt ratio is infinity. Okay. So without growth, you won't have an equilibrium debt ratio. Now the intriguing thing that I wasn't expecting when I put the model together, was this is, this is an emergent property of the model, is that wages, wages share is a residual. Because of, as I said, the system state, so the employment rate, the wage share of output, and the debt ratio. But the system states are the profit rate, the employment rate, and the debt ratio. So wages become a residual, even though in this program workers are not doing not doing any borrowing at all. They're not actually borrowing the money, but it ends up that their wages share is negatively related to the level of debt. And that's in the equilibrium. It carries over to the dynamic behaviour as well. So the workers end up paying for the higher debt share with the lower income share. So this is a direct explanation for rising inequality in a class-based sense. Because as the debt level rises, it doesn't affect the capitalists. You know, they, they have equilibrium ruling, you know, they're fluctuating around it all the way through. It ends up the workers end up paying for the higher debt level. Which is a strong argument for a new, for a uh, for a moratorium. See, with an unstable equilibrium, the profit share will fluctuate around that equilibrium before the collapse. And I didn't get a chance to embed uh, a model of that uh, or a graph of this. I'll bring up this, the Minsky program and show a simulation showing that this is. Uh, let's see where we've got the profit rate here. Where am I? Profit shares down here. I'll simulate this slowly. I haven't actually built in a the equilibrium value into the into that graph, but if you'll watch the profit share, 
the cycles are getting smaller and smaller and it looks like the system is heading towards equilibrium from a capitalist point of view. Wages shares declining, which they're happy to ignore because who cares about workers anyway. Uh, debt levels rising and that's great because we all think the city is fantastic. And then suddenly the profit rate plunges down to zero and goes negative because at this point the rate of decline of wages is below the compounding of debt and that compounding of debt is amplified by the fact that in this model I'm now including prices so deflation kicks in as well to, to hyper amplify the rate of growth of debt. So you get this, if, again if you, so if you're focusing just upon the profit rate and saying it's all about you know how well the profit rate's doing and an employment rate and inflation everything looked fantastic and then it collapses without warning. Ha. Well, what's actually happening is you're being attracted towards, in this model, of the bad equilibrium. What I've shown you is, a, is a, what Matthias Griselli termed the good equilibrium, where you have a positive employment rate, a positive wage share of output, and a finite debt ratio. So, but there's another equilibrium where you have zero employment, zero wage share, and an infinite debt ratio. And what we've seen, what we've get trapped into is that effective black hole of debt, using Trin Andresen's phrase. Uh, and you can see it turning up in the model. But you only see it if you include private debt. And of course, that's what the neoclassicals leave out. They argue, and this is quoting my uh, Bernanke, one of my favorite state. I've used this quote so many times. I've given him so many references in, in, um, you know, in, in Google, because uh, I cite him all the time, but I'm trashing him all the time. This is what Randy Ray made this case very well on the uh, Journal of Post Keynesian Economics recently, Randy and, and uh, Jan Kregel, saying Post Keynesians should try to quote each other more often and not quote the <laughs> neoclassicals. Yeah? But if you want to see, you, maybe if you're somewhere having a negative citation. Anyway, so this is a, my, one of my classic negative citations. This is why Bernanke ignored Fisher's debt deflation theory. And so you look at what they're doing, they're completely ignoring a major determining factor. So let's quote the Queen here. Um, nobody could have seen this coming, of course, is the phrase they like using, because the Queen, had this, I think, was it the London School of Economics? Was it? Okay. You know, if this, and this, because she's famous for, for not actually saying what she thinks. And here she just couldn't help herself. She blurted out, if these things were so large, how come everybody missed them? Why did nobody notice? And if you look at what she was told, what, what the neoclassicals are focusing upon is the un inflation rate, the unemployment rate. What they saw was the great moderation going on. And what they ignore is the rising level of private debt to GDP. And that's what, of course, because I had this Minsky model, that's what I was looking at. And if you include that in your system, you get it's clearly a debt-driven collapse. And they had no idea, but it was it was there in the system. And I've now realized, isn't it, to make this case about stating it in, in a qualitative sense, making that qualitative interpretation of differential equations that we were discussing earlier. You can rephrase it and say that the employment rate okay, will rise if the growth rate for the economy exceeds labour productivity and population growth. But there's the growth rate of the economy and there's population and labour productivity. The wage share will rise if the real, if real wage demands, as I've got it here because I've been working in, in, the, in a non-price model here, uh, exceeds labour productivity. And rephrasing that debt equation, it actually became, once, once I just reworked the terms a bit, became obvious that those first two elements of it were the rate of growth of debt. Okay. So the debt ratio will rise if the rate of growth of debt exceeds the rate of growth of the economy. Okay. So then those are three absolutely true, non-deniable statements. And neoclassicals can't deny the first two because they, they treat employment and wage share as essential parts of modelling the economy, you know, in, 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 or income distribution as part of it. Uh, so they can only ignore the third one by believing in loanable funds, which they happily do. But that's why they didn't see the crisis coming, because their the model leaves out the role of debt in this whole equation. They, deny, they, they cannot deny the truth of that statement but they neutralise it by saying debt is just a redistribution. Therefore, has no macroeconomic impact. Well, they're wrong, unfortunately. So I ended up, because, because I included debt in my model, I ended up with this, what I regarded as a rhetorical flourish when I wrote it. I wrote it back in August of 1992. 
I look back and look at my original papers, and I said the chaotic dynamics explored in this paper should warn us against accepting a period of relative tranquility as anything other than a lull before the storm. So I, you know, I wrote it when there was the great moderation hadn't entered the, the jargon yet because what people were seeing from the AUs going forward is rising inflation, the stagflation, rising inflation, rising unemployment. So this phenomenon of seeing, looking back and seeing that actually the peak of unemployment and inflation in the, in the 80s, 80s crisis was greater than the peaks in the 90s crisis was greater. Well, actually, 90s was a higher unemployment rate, but the trend for inflation falling wasn't visible at this stage when I wrote it, nor was this trend for each of the subsequent cycles to have a lower unemployment rate. But having done all this, I think I've got some extra to call inside. Um, so I had three ambitions left when I finished it, including price dynamics, extending it to doing multi-sectoral modelling, and explicitly modelling money. And there's, what I should have done is the first one first, the second one second, the third one third. I've done a, I actually did the second first, um, the third second, and ultimately the first as a result of the, the third one. There's no logical sequence to it in terms of getting there, just the way things worked out. Um, so with monetary modelling, to me the essential insight came from Graziani of saying that money is, not, is, a, is, a, commod is a token, it's not a commodity. Uh, and it's a means of final settlement, otherwise it would just be credit, not actual money. And it can't give seniorage rights that are unlimited to the group issuing it. Put those three together, you then get the argument that the transactions are triangular. And that to me was a brilliant insight that rather than the two person, two commodity stuff that neoclassicals treat capitalism as, a monetary system is three, three, it's a three sided transaction. A buyer, a seller and a bank that recalls the transfer of money in one direction that justifies the transfer of goods in the other. So that, to me, without that insight I wouldn't have developed uh, the Minsky argument and equally uh, looking at the work that Stephanie Bell, now Stephanie Kelton did back then, talking about this pyramidal structure. I don't know that she'd uh, been influenced by Graziani before she wrote this. I must actually ask her one day. Um, but what you get this whole idea of a multi-tiered pyramid and it's various levels within the system, different capacities to create money of a higher rank than each other exists in the whole system. Of course you can then argue there are lower pyramids when you have a, a huge expansion in a shadow banking system then people start using mutual funds for checks etc etc. Um, there are only two levels which have um, complete acceptability, and that's credit money at one level and fiat money at the other. So the combination of Graziani's insights and these insights about the hierarchical na nature of money led to developing Minsky, the software package. And just to, to represent what's going on in, in the way I'm building Minsky and trying to extend it, you start by saying that there's this sort of triangular relationship when you see the banking sector as a whole and have a payer and a payee, then when you have the transfer of money from the payer to payee, they can't create money, which the, that's the loanable funds vision as well, lending between those two parties can't create money, but the banking sector does create credit money. And then when you have a multi-bank system, then you've got to have a central bank through which those banks make their transfers. And that's, the central bank has the capacity to create fiat money, which ranks higher than credit money does. And of course you've got to trust the apex in both cases and of course what we've got now in capitalism is neither condition applies. We neither trust, uh, trust, the, trust the apex nor are they stable. So we've got a wonderfully complicated world we live in right now. So when you show this, in, this is using a bit of an old interface from Minsky, uh, but if you have lending from one from say households to firms, which is what's being shown here, that's just a transfer of existing liabilities, it doesn't create any money. But when you then say that, that you have the banks doing the lending to the firm sector, then you've got a creation of debt here with a creation of money over there. And you've got a, that's the importance of including endogenous money in the thinking as well. So the increase in loans causes an increase in, in money in deposits and it also causes an increase in demand and income. I haven't, I don't cover that fully in this particular lecture, I've run out of time. But that's the major element that I bring in with, a, when you now bring in endogenous money, and what you get is demand 
and income uh, demand an income from the circulation of existing money, which is Milton Friedman's V times M, plus change in debt. Okay? That's a dynamic version of, 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 of Milton Friedman. Okay. Um, so the fiat money, again, you, you can model this in Minsky by having a hierarchy of banking components. And what I've got happening here is, for example, if I have the government borrowing money from the central bank effectively, okay, when you look at ish issuing bonds, and then using that money to pay um, a subsidy to people in the private sector, then you've got reserves being created up here and money being created down here. That sort of logic. And um, I'm going to, I'm jumping around a bit here now because I just ran out of time to organise this properly, I'm sorry to say. Um, <coughs> but this is showing, I've gone back to the Minsky model in many ways because I, I want to make Minsky a possible way of building completely integrated physical and monetary models of the economy. Uh, and Minsky's, the, the uh, table section of Minsky, the, what are called godly tables, that can guarantees that your accounting is accurate. Okay? But it doesn't guarantee stock flow consistency yet. That's another level of logic I need to add to the software. And when I include in the flowchart side of the software as well, there's not a, you can link the two together, which is easy to do, but to guarantee that stock flow consistency again across those two ways of using a software is still not done. That's why I need more development funds for Minsky. Uh, but again, just to now look at this statement when I include inflation inside here. I get much the same basic argument up here for the employment rate. Employment rises is the great way that includes population growth and labour productivity. But now for workers, I've now got money wage demands being greater than labour productivity and the inflation rate. And the debt ratio, now again debt will rise if the debt growth rate exceeds the real growth rate plus inflation. So you now get inflation elements turning up to the system as well. And again, the, the beauty of doing a structural model is a good model is in adding an extra realism of the financial sector financing investment as well, is that you can't disagree with the statements. You could only argue one shouldn't be included for the wrong reasons, which is what the neoclassicals have done. But you, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond motherhood. This is gravity. Okay? You can't deny those statements. But you could never understand them either. You could never say, well, put those three statements together and know what's going to happen. You've got to simulate them. So one thing I've done just recently to try to make the case about how much the model captures what actually happened in the real economy is this is a simulation of, the, uh, of my model. And this is the American data smoothed over time. And what you see in the data is in this model is this cyclical behavior Looks like a setting to runs equilibrium, and then suddenly this happens. Okay. Look in the data itself in America, same sort of rough cycles, and suddenly this happens. Tilt them up, and you can now see the role of debt inside there. And I've explained the logic behind that with the uh, with the argument about the workers' wages share being a residual, and so on earlier. And tilt up the data and the real data as well. And there's the same thing the neoclassicals are ignoring, that rising level of private debt to GDP. So, I'll actually might finish on this note, we'll finish up pretty shortly because we give Paul a chance to take over for the second half, but part of what I had to do was derive a price equation. Now, I could have used Koleski's markup pricing equation. There's, there's neo, there are non-neoclassical pricing models out there all the time. I've got this obsession with wanting to derive everything from first principles. It's a hang-up of too much mathematics in my background. So I, I wasn't happy with doing that, uh, and I wanted to find you know, a monetary reason to derive the price equation. So in building a simple model, the, a monetary system using Minsky, actually using QED when I did this one first time around, I think, I, I f was forced to think in terms of equilibrium in the sense of if you imagine a flow of demand and a flow of supply coming onto the market and the price playing that equilibrating level role, then can you derive an equilibrium price expression from that? Okay. If prices actually have the, the role that neoclassicals believe they have in the economy. Well, 
in equilibrium, that the physical flow of, of demand, how many goods people want, is going to be equal to the physical supply of those under the from the factory from factory output, so there's no change overall applying. So physical output Q would be equal to physical demand D. Now physical output Q is going to be labor productivity times labor. Nice and simple. Okay. Where the labor, the amount you're going to employ, is going to be the flow of money, and now I'm getting to the, the monetary part of the argument, the flow of, of money uh, wages divided by the wage rate. Gives you how many workers are employed. And when I work this out, uh, this looks, might look slightly complicated, but it's pretty straightforward. That's GDP. The FD is the firm's, the amount of money in the firm's account. Tau S is the turnover rate of that money. So effectively, that's GDP, output from the firm sector. One minus, oh, so that's, that's the, dollar, the, the amount of money in the firm sector that's actually turning over in their accounts over time. 1 minus S, which I think I was playing, no, hang on, pardon me, turnover rate, <laughs> explanation out of sequence. So what I'm using here is Marx's idea of a turnover rate. You have a certain amount of money in the economy and it turns over so many times per year. So that tau S is how, uh, over what period of time does that money turn over? And like in a simple example, you might say it turns over three times a year, which is pretty similar, similar to but not the same as the velocity of money, because this is just looking at the money in the firm sector itself where the output's being produced. And the one minus S is workers' share. So that's going to be the flow of money wages divided by the money wage. You're going to work out how many workers you hire. So I can now say the quantity to being produced is going to be labour productivity multiplied by those, that expression. Now, physical demand is going to be the flow of demand overall divided by the price level. And that's expenditure divided by price. And Again, total GDP in the economy is going to be that. This is, this is adding together workers and capitalists. I've got one minus S up here, as you notice. I've got effectively one down here. I'm adding together worker and capitalist demand divided by the price level. So you equate D and Q, do your cancellations. Now notice you've got tau S here, tau S here, FD there, FD here. I've got one minus F and FD and A. Shuffle it around, and there's your price equation. Saying the equilibrium price level is going to be one over one minus s, where s is the worker's share, s is the capital share of output, multiplied by the money wage divided by labour productivity. And then to give to so what you're actually arguing is that price, the price uh, level plays the role of converting the physical share of surplus capitalists have, which is what Marx explained with the Hassel of the labour theory of value, which I won't go into right now. Uh, into a monetary sum, which is what they're actually after. And effectively that's Kolesky's markup pricing equation, but I've derived it in terms of social class elements and wage payments rather than simply a degree of monopoly and so on coming out of it. So the dynamic equation is simply a first order time lag. And here I just add minus one over tau p inside there. And if you have, if this is, this is the pressure that's going to determine prices, this is the current price, if money way if, if this is greater than P, then that's going to be a negative amount multiplied by negative, which is going to give you a positive over here, so prices will rise, and vice versa. That's the role of this, this time lag is an important part of an engineering approach to modelling dynamic systems. And that's the tau P there is the number of years it takes for the price to converge. And what you actually, if you actually graph this, you, if you have an exponential decay towards equilibrium, then that tau, if you take the tangent at the very beginning of it, then where that tangent intersects with zero will tell you how will give you the value of tau s in years. Okay. I could again, if I had more time, I'll, I'll go through and explain that. But it's a, a common engineering concept. It ends up being uh, what's called the 63% rule as well. So the question which I, you can in the neoclassical will come back and tell everything's going to be solved by the price system. You left prices out of your model, therefore if you include prices everything's going to be hunky-dory. Well, what it actually does is it reduces the equilibrium debt ratio. You have this is a set of expressions coming out for um, the pre equilibrium profit share, equilibrium employment rate, and equilibrium debt level. And notice I've now, as well as having alpha plus beta on the on the denominator here, I've got the equilibrium inflation rate. Okay. 
So the inflation rate is now part of the argument. What that actually does is reduce the equilibrium debt level, okay? which might sound like a good thing. Um, it actually makes the system more unstable because when that becomes a negative, okay, if it becomes enough of a negative, the equilibrium level goes towards infinity. So it's actually a destabilizing influence. And what it does is accelerates the impact of excessive debt, which is the argument Fisher made back in the debt deflation theory of Great Depressions. So you know, to do all that, of course, I'm, I'll finish off in a bit of a hurry here to let Paul uh, take over, but to, that's all, all this has been done implicitly. It doesn't actually involve an explicit financial sector. I've developed Minsky to enable to explicitly include the financial system. It's got to the stage where it's quite a pow powerful software package in its own right, with a few quirks, it, loses, it doesn't have a few essential features of things like being able to copy and paste between models and stuff like that. But the ultimate ambition is to make it a multi-sectoral and multi-country country model. Okay. An extra million pounds, please, and I'll get that done in a hurry. There is a way to donate through PayPal if you want to get some features. There's a PayPal link on my website, use it, because it goes to, to Russell directly, it doesn't go anywhere near me, but it gets a chance to, to extend the system. So now. Most economists I know, and including most you know, post Keynesians, aren't familiar with the whole idea of modelling dynamic systems using a flowchart. The engineers invented it in the 1950s, and the first engineer invented it went by the strange name of Bill Phillips. Okay? We could have been the first on the bloody planet if we hadn't derided the guy for what they call hydraulic Keynesianism. He built the first system, which was actually an analog electric computer, as well as building the hydraulic models people know about. And he was using this technology and trying to get economists to adopt it. So we stuffed up and the engineers have taken over. If you want to buy a copy of MATLAB Simulink, uh, you'll get a bit of change out of 3,000 quid for that. You'll get some change out of 2,000 for VizSim. VizSim's about 1,000 pounds. Still is about the same. X costs are free. One mathematical model got 1,000 quid. Minsky's free. Okay. More reason to help donate, please. Um, and it's, it's the ignorance that I find in economists is just amazing. This, I had this crazy exchange with this guy, Noah Smith, who writes a blog called No Opinion. Generally not bad, but I, I was walking off to go to my, my nephew's graduation in an Australian university, I think just flown back into the country that same day, and suddenly this tweet turns up, thinking of writing a post on the absurdity of Steve Keen's new Minsky tool. Worth it? Not worth it? Counterproductive? So I'm walking along through the streets of Wollongong, if anybody knows that town, and tapped out uh, any you know, neoclassic calling any system that makes pattern of absurd, you're, you're priceless, and then bang it, see, on for a battle. And then he says, before I fire, tell me what the wires do in the tool. But this guy has a degree in physics. I didn't really actually finish his undergraduate degree, but he, I, I, I thought, you mean you don't even know that this technology has been around for five decades? And the first commercial version, I think probably was MATLAB Simulink, and that's at least 20 years old. I, I bought VizSim um, in 1993, when I was doing my PhD. I forked out about $3,500 for it, Australian. So this stuff is over 20 years old. He thinks I've invented the wires and stuffed up in doing it. Just amazing. So what's actually going on, first of all, is in general, these equations replace direct equation assignments with a flow chart. So this is saying, so let's say GDP is 100 and labour productivity is one worker per unit of output. Then you divide GDP by labour productivity, you get how many workers you need to hire. If you have a population of 100, divide the workers by population, you get the employment rate. So it's using a flow chart to do the assignments. They are assignments. He thought there was time lags built into the wires, which is just nonsense. But And he also thought I invented the bloody stuff, which is just hilarious. Uh, now, what they also do is they, they don't use differentials because when you're doing it numerically, differentiation is a much more unstable process than integration. You imagine climbing a mountain, the ups and downs of the slope, the height or the area beneath you is, changes much more slowly. So numerical integration is needed. So this is Minsky, a uh, Google model done an early version of Minsky, and that's a differential block just there integration block, pardon me. So you have to take your equation and convert it into an integral equation and then draw it out this way. Minsky then converts that to something like these sets of statements, where you can see the rate of change of wages. And it then does the simulation using what's called a runge-cutter algorithm. It's a way of 
It's like a fifth order Taylor series, a very accurate way of approximating a dynamic system. Now, what, it, what Minsky does add, which is new, is the capacity to uh, do double entry bookkeeping. And I didn't even get a chance to write that up. Maybe next, next set of lectures. So, thank you.